shortly after he got ordained, one of my very best friends in the priesthood started these informal discipleship groups. And because I have all the respect in the world for him, I remember asking him what he was doing in the context of these groups. And basically what he told me was that, at least in this early stage of the game, he was teaching the people entrusted to his care basic terminology. And basically what he was getting at was this. Learning basic terminology, like learning what words actually mean, is an important prerequisite to thinking about the faith, communicating about the faith, and ultimately evangelization. And I remember when I heard my friends say this, thinking to myself, that makes a whole lot of sense. And so the example that comes to mind, I remember once in my previous parish, visiting one of our local schools and talking to the kids in one classroom about uh, the sacraments and in particular the sacrament of the sick, otherwise known as the anointing of the sick. So as you probably know, the anointing of the sick culminates with the anointing with sacred oil on the forehead and on the palms of the sick person in question. Anyways, more to the point, when I was visiting this classroom, talking to the kids about the anointing of the sick, I led with a question. So I basically asked the kids, does anyone know what is actually the anointing of the sick? And one little girl put up her hand, and I called upon her, and she said with a completely straight face, the anointing of the sick is basically when you visit a sick person, let's say in the hospital, and you're talking to them, and, and you're going on and on and on, and you won't stop talking. And I remember looking to her and kind of pausing, and then kind of going like, Oh, no, not the annoying of the sick. It's the anointing of the sick, right? So again, terminology, right? Words make a difference in terms of your understanding of basic theology. Anyways, that's sort of a lengthy preamble to the thing I really want to talk about today, this sort of short word study, if you will, with regards to the word deny. Specifically, as you find it in the context of the Gospel of Mark chapter 8, where the Lord says, whoever wishes to become my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Now, I would suggest that for most people, when they look at this word, which is rendered here as deny, most people think about some manner of penitential practice, uh, wearing hair shirts, um, whipping themselves, uh, denying themselves things like you know, meat, chocolate, whatever the case may be. But actually, if you look at the original Greek, the, the, the word connotes this idea of complete self-dispossession. So there's this really great American priest, Father John Ricardo, who I've quoted many times in the past. He has a great analogy to kind of explain this particular point. So he says, basically, imagine you're driving a car, you're driving your own car, and Jesus is in the car. So basically, it's a question of, like, what's your working image of God? So do you think of God basically as the divine GPS, telling you to take a right, to take a left, wherever the case may be? Instead of thinking of God rather as someone who says to you, get out of my seat, right? get out of the driver's seat because, again, that's my seat. This is my car. You belong to me, right? It's the very essence of holiness, to belong not to yourself, but to belong entirely to Christ. Complete self-dispossession. To further illustrate the point, let's turn back again to the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. So long before he makes that statement to find the prerequisite, if you will, to authentic discipleship, the Lord has a really important conversation with St. Peter at Caesarea Philippi. The Lord says, who do people say that I am? Some people throw out a few suggestions. Then Peter gives the right answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock I shall found my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But then, of course, the Lord talks about how the Son of Man will eventually suffer and die at the hands of his enemies before being raised back from the dead three days later. In response to which, Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. Partially because he's concerned about his friend, but also because he is completely scandalized. He is completely scandalized by the idea that an important prerequisite to being Christian, to becoming a follower of Christ, means you got to die to oneself. Now, of course, in response to him, the Lord says to St. Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you have become a stumbling block to me. Which, if you think about it, is actually a really clever play on words, if you will, on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, of course, just earlier in the story, Jesus had called Peter the rock, the first leader of the fledging church. But now he calls him a stumbling block. So a rock, a stumbling block, again, sort of a play on words. So basically what he's saying is that either you follow Christ with sincerity of heart, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, however you want to frame it, in which case you become a radiant witness of the Christian thing, or you don't. You don't follow Christ with integrity of heart. You insist on doing your own thing, in which case it's kind of interesting. You don't maintain a neutral position, but in fact, you become a cause of scandal to other people. Because the whole idea is that even if people aren't Christian, even if they don't identify with the faith, they know intuitively that to be a Christian means you've got to follow Christ with integrity of heart. It means, practically speaking, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. It means you have to walk habitually out of the stance of sacrificial love. And again, more to the point, when that isn't in place, people are scandalized. They expect to see the suffering Christ in your very being, and when they don't, they fall away from the Christian thing. They are scandalized because instead of being a rock, you are in fact a stumbling block. Okay, now one final example, and I'll kind of end with this. 
So as I was reaching the end of my seminary formation, starting to be a priest, obviously I had to make a really big decision. Do I decide to go ahead and get ordained as a transitional deacon and eventually as a Catholic priest, or do I decide to leave the seminary and pursue other options? And, and obviously that particular issue was causing me a, a bit of stress. So I decided to do what I typically do when I'm feeling stressed. I decided to see a movie by myself. And I went to Silver City Young and Angleton, which at the time was one of the few movie theaters that showed uh, movies at a kind of weird show times. So at the time, most movie theaters showed films at like 4, 7, and 9. But this particular theater showed movies at like 3, 5.30, 8.30, 10.30, that type of thing, right? So I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to go to this place. And whatever is showing at like this particular time, short of like a skanky movie, um, I'm going to go see that. And so as, as fate would have it, if you will, I ended up seeing this movie called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And what's more, it just so happened that the particular showtime that I picked coincided with this thing called Stars and Strollers Night. And so for those of you who don't know what that is, Stars and Strollers Night is basically designed for young parents and their babies. So basically, you got a picture of the situation. Their lights were brighter than usual. The sound was turned down a little bit. There was a diaper changing station, young mothers and their babies, and, and me you know, watching this matinee showing of Diary of a Wimpy Kid. So it was kind of humiliating. Anyway, so massive spoiler alert, not that I think that you care, but um, the basic plot of the movie revolves around this, this wimpy kid who is writing a diary, and he's got this friend named Rowley who's kind of socially awkward, but he's good, he's faithful, like he's a good friend, right? And the wimpy kid, his whole goal in the context of like grade school, he's trying to become the most popular kid in school, so like really lofty goals, right? But in the midst of trying to become the most popular kid in school, not only does he fail, but in fact, he's hurting himself and Rally, right? So at a certain point, I think Rally even breaks his arm. So it's not going well. Anyways, near the end of the movie, there's these older kids who catch the wimpy kid on Rally, and now they're trying to punish them for something which happened earlier on in the film. Now, needless to say, Rally is innocent when it comes to this particular situation, but nonetheless, he is chosen first by these older kids to be punished again for this thing which happened earlier on in the film. So basically what these older kids decide to do is that they essentially force Rally now to eat this, this moldy piece of cheese from the playground floor. So as a matter of background, early on in the film, both the Wimpy Kid and Rally, they, they learn of this urban legend which had developed in the school called the Cheese Touch. And so basically, years ago, a foreign exchange student had touched this moldy piece of cheese on the playground floor, as a result of which he was essentially banished back to where he came from, I believe like Eastern Europe or someplace like that. Anyways, the whole idea is that the foreign exchange student was banished back to his home country as a result of simply touching the cheese. What's going to happen now to Rally as a result of actually eating the cheese? Now at this point, the recess bell goes off, and all these boys and girls start pouring out into the playground, and they see Rally holding this half-eaten piece of cheese, and they start pointing at him, and they're they're horrified, right? But then the camera turns to Rally, and he's just he's just devastated, right? Like he's about to cry, his lip is trembling, because he's about to be hated and rejected forever. At which point, the wimpy kid steps in, and what he says is, "I ate the cheese. I ate the cheese." as a result of which the school, the entire school, hates him. But he doesn't care because his friend is spared. And so the two of them kind of walk off into the sunset, if you will, uh, confirmed in their friendship, and with that, the movie basically ends. Anyway, so I'm watching this movie, right? And I'm sitting there with, you know, the young mothers and their babies and the diaper changing station and the whole nine yards. And I'm just, like, bawling my eyes out, right? Because I'm thinking to myself, this is so beautiful. And more to the point, like, Rowley is emblematic of Christ, right? Like he is so good. He is so loyal. He is so faithful. He is so amazing. But for the most part, people don't see it. And what's more, the people who should love him don't love him, but instead treat him with, with scorn and with disdain. So again, the figure of Rowley is completely emblematic of the person of Christ. And on top of that, I kind of realized that I was sort of lying to myself. Because for years, I've been telling myself that I was discerning in the sense of kind of saying like, well, I'm not really sure whether I'm called to the Holy Priesthood. Like I knew, I knew in retrospect, but I was just afraid. And I wanted the Lord to give me a guarantee. Like you got a guarantee in advance that this thing is going to work out for me, short of which I will not do this thing. I will not proceed and get ordained to the Holy Priesthood. And looking back, I was focusing on all the wrong questions. Questions like, will I suffer? Will it be challenging? Will it be difficult? Whereas in retrospect, the question I should have been focusing on was a question which didn't even come from me, because it couldn't, because it can only come from the Lord. And that question is basically this, do you love me? And you see, the thing you got to keep in mind is that when the Lord poses to you this question, which indeed he poses to each one of us, make no mistake, when you say yes, which you hopefully do, he will always say to you some variation of, 
feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. In other words, have courage, be brave, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Walk the path of suffering love without worrying about the past, without worrying about the present. Just walk with me and be with me out of the stance of habitual suffering love. Anyways, just to close off this particular story, after watching that movie, Die of a Wimpy Kid, I decided to get ordained, thinking that after I got ordained, every single day after that would be just a total disaster. Like I'd be locked in a perpetual wall of depression, agony, however you want to frame it. But, you know, the Lord's calling me to the Holy Priestess. So what are you going to do? I love the Lord. He wants me to do this. So I'm going to do what he wants me to do. But you see, here's the thing. Even though I got ordained with that particular expectation in mind, after I got ordained, my life has been beautiful. I mean, the priesthood has its challenges, not unlike any other vocation, right? But at the same time, I got to say, without any word of a lie, that it is only after I got ordained that I came to experience a peace in my heart that I had never experienced before in my entire life. And I would suggest that I came to experience that peace because I had the courage and the wherewithal to follow Christ with sincerity, to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Him. Because I had the courage, basically, to eat the cheese, if you will. Anyways, the reason why I bring up this particular example is not so much to toot my own horn, but to suggest to you that the idea of following Christ with integrity always seems scary from the outside. It always seems like it's going to lead to total disaster, except it doesn't. But you see, the only way you can discover that is if you commit to Christ 100%. No parachute, no backup plan. To give Him everything and to hold back nothing. Because when you do, you'll come to realize in retrospect that it is only in following the person of Christ that you can find what you're truly looking for, the fullness of the Christian experience, and a true foretaste in the eternal life yet to come. Whoever wishes to become the Lord's disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Him. And may God bless you all.